Good evening, everybody. Welcome, Bonsoir, and Susayam. We welcome Lopa Mudra, who is with us. And uh, as we say in French, that when you start serving the aperitif, people start coming. So though there aren't many, we will start with uh, her uh, introduction. And then I hope other people will join us in time. By the time she will speak. So, a little bit about Lopa. She's an alumnus of Sri Ashram School, lived in the US for many years, and currently teaching online courses in the Ashram School in Pondicherry. She's a writer, psychological counselor, teacher of Indian culture and spirituality. And as a writer, she has written quite a few books, a historical fiction on India called The Soul of India, collection of short stories on how India and the West have influenced each other. East and West crosswords, Antariksha, the inner space, a journey into a dream world, and so on. And have some, made some documentary films, and we might show those films in a few weeks later. So now I'll pass on to Lopa, who will speak about, uh, to us about the foundation of Indian culture, which is a vast topic. And I hope in few sessions, she can cover the essence of Shobindo's book, Foundation of Indian Culture. Thank you, Lupa. Thank you for coming. And thank you, Devasmitadi, for this introduction. So um, we are a small, cozy group. So I would like it to be interactive. OK, so even before we start, I want you to tell me what you want to do in which order. So we have three days, three Thursdays, and roughly one and a half hours of interactive sections. So. Um, to, before we decide what we're going to do, I'll just show you uh, a list of items that uh, Sri Aurobindo wrote in his Foundations of Indian Culture. First of all, it's not his name. The topic for this book is not his. So they published it somewhere in the, in the US. It was published and they gave this name and it's okay. He wasn't there also at that time. It's 1953. So what happened to these collection of writings? So here's the book right now. You know, in 1972, when it was Sri Aurobindo's centenary, the Ashram Press came out with volumes of Sri Aurobindo's works. So at that time, they picked this name, Foundations of Indian Culture, from the earlier publication. But he produced these essays separately in his Arya. We know that he had, for 19, from 1914 to 1920, he published the Arya. So these essays came out after the war, First World War, 1918 to 1920. All the series of essays on Indian culture. And at that point, let's try to be where they were at that point. So India, 100 years back, was called the lost country by a lot of people in the world because they had an inclination or they, they knew that India was such a high culture and then look at where they are right now. In 1900s, they've been conquered by the British. They don't have any money. They don't have any say in their own lifestyle. The laws are made against them. The judiciary works against them. So as a people, India was at its lowest. So the kind of writing that people like Sri Aurobindo wrote at, this, at that age is going to be different from what he would have written now. Now, with 75 years of India's uh, independence and such a lot of blossoming of Indian culture. So at that time, he wrote a few essays called Renaissance in India, where he questioned, is there a renaissance that has happened in India? So there's a history to that. People said, yes, India had a renaissance and it started roughly in the 1830s with Ramohan Roy. He started a new movement of a new kind of dharma the Brahmo Samaj, the Arya Samaj, and so on. So there was a lot of these spiritual movements that flourished in India at that time. 
So people called it the Bengal Renaissance to start with because most of these people were in Bengal, Tagore, uh, Ramon Roy, etc. And then it spilled over to the rest of India. So they say it's an Indian Renaissance. But then going back in time, you know, history was always revised. So people like Sri Aurobindo went back. They looked at what really happened in India and they said that little thing, you call it renaissance. And we have this whole treasure house of culture, spirituality, wisdom text. And the little sparks that you saw in 1900, 1800, it's not a renaissance. We should create a renaissance of our own. Even now people are asking, did India ever have it? Is it ready for a renaissance? People will keep asking that. But it's that each of us are contributing a little bit to the renaissance in India. And while we speak right now of a renaissance in India, the very concept of should we just think of India as a renaissance or we are all citizens of the world? The, the nation concept itself, we are transcending. So why think of making India proud or we as Indians, we should take up Indian culture and tell the world India was so great. Because that age is also passing. The time spirit seems to say that there should not be any nations. And especially here in Auroville, the whole experiment was to transcend nation, race, culture. So this, this environment we are in tells us that why are we even talking about a renaissance in India? So it begs the question, why are we talking of the past, whereas we are people of the future? So we keep all these things in mind as we go through this. I have a question. Usually they say that when you are well rooted in your own culture, then you can appreciate and adapt to different other cultures. So for that, I think we have to know well about our own culture, the foundation of uh, Indian uh, <coughs> deaths and inner meaning of this uh, culture. Then only we can say now we can go around anywhere and yes. we don't, uh, we are not uh, somebody who will be just okay. shaken by or taken up by other cultures. Right, right. I mean, given that you have a foundation, then you can think of world citizenship and to create a international culture. But if you don't have your own culture, where do you start from? So that's why we are still going to study foundations of Indian culture. And I'm very aware of the fact that especially in Auroville, it's going to be a mixed culture. Everyone is not an Indian person who's come here. So that's why I want to make it even more interactive and find out how deep you want to go into Indian culture. Like what is your engagement with this culture? Yes, it's an open forum. We are here to discuss. We are here to go ahead. We may just look back at our past, but we are not here to just say the past was glorious. But we look out and things are not so glorious. So that's also part of our discussion. So I wanted to show you the series of essays that Sri wrote. So there's this book that has come out as in 1972. It was called The Foundations of Indian Culture. And the, in the new set of volumes, it's called The Collective Words collected works of Sri Aurobindo, the title has changed. It has become Renaissance in India. It's because they have included four essays that Sri Aurobindo wrote under that title, Renaissance in India. And they think it's more important or it's a more future looking title compared to foundations of Indian culture because we also want to invite people to start a Renaissance in India. So there are lots of uh, essays from which I made collection of his words and a bit of my notes also and I put the whole book in 24 pages. So I would like to share that with you. So as we study this text together, you can study this text outside this uh, one and a half hours period so that when you come here, we can discuss what he has said and this, uh, my sessions will sort of provide you the groundwork or create the foundations for you to read the foundations of Indian culture. So we'll talk about, um, there are five things that uh, I have identified as things that would help you read this text. So first of all, we can look at what the text says, the heads, it's like the characteristics of the culture and the cycle of the culture, all Indian culture, the decline and need for Renaissance, 
the Western influence, the movements in India in the 1900s, assimilation from external influence, religion and its extremes. And then another series of articles that is called right now the rationalistic critique on Indian culture, but Shiobindo wrote it as a defense of Indian culture. And at that time, he was actually defending the culture uh, against a few authors from Britain who had come to visit India and they showed India in a very poor light. One particular author was William Archer that Shiobindo mentions many times in this book. And there was this Catherine Mayo who wrote uh, Mother India and Gandhiji said it's like a drain inspector's report. That she just came to India, looked at the drains and she made a report of that and she says that is India. So they were a very, um, it was the age of Orientalism. It's not just India that got victimized with this sort of view. Uh, the Middle East, different parts of Asia also got this view. And all the conquered places, basically the South Bloc, had this problem going on. India was one of them and Sri wrote this book called The Defense on Indian Culture. But now we have a lot of this material that's not relevant, not so relevant anymore. Because there's a lot of awareness in the world and a lot of people know about India. Ever since Vivekananda opened the door in 1893, he showed what... Um, Indian spirituality is and slowly it's been growing over time. So the word yoga now, even if it is misused, it's become a common part of everyone's dictionary. In any country, you go any language, they know what yoga means. I mean, they think it's asanas, but at least it's not ignorance. There was a time when people thought that only snake charmers lived in India. It's a jungle. So they know that this civilization or this culture has a lot to offer to the world. And they also have a sense that this one survived, despite all the conquests that came from other countries, other cultures, this one survived. How come? If it's a land of snake charmers, it wouldn't have survived. But it survived, so there is a lot of awareness. So at this point, we don't have to go back to what William Archer said and his ilk, we don't. Sri himself said before his passing that, this is one book he would have loved to revise and remove all the comparisons he did with the West. This is what the West thinks of East, of India. And this is what India really is. So instead of that, he said, I'll remove the whole part which said, this is what the West thinks of India, but I'll just portray what India is. So in this collection that I made of 24 pages, I removed that part. It's not a comparative study. It's just about what India is. So I'll, I'll share it in whichever way we'll figure out with uh, Devasmitadi. So you can have this and use this as a text as we follow these three days of lectures. And to start with, he talks about the fact that everything in India, whether it's art, architecture, politics, religion, society, how we live, customs, everything stems from a spiritual foundation. So people believed in spirituality very deeply. They were connected to that deep core or core value or set of values. And from there, everything else stemmed. So given that, there are five topics I have identified. And now you choose what you want to do, in which order. I'm not sure we'll get to all five. So the first is a little, a quick history of India to get a very big picture view of what it is so we don't get stuck with certain periods which get highlighted because of course history is people's biases. So I've tried to give it like in 10 different points, the, the major dynasties and events that, had hap that have happened to India. So that's one thing. And the second is what is dharma? What is this thing called dharma, which is one of the core principles of India? And there are several uh, different aspects of dharma, or different core values in dharma. So we're going to discuss those values. If you know those values, then you know what Indian culture is. And you can apply those values to art, politics, everywhere. So that's also a foundational uh, way of looking at Indian culture. Then there is in-depth study of spirituality. So here we go into the Upanishads. 
we can do like several sessions. I teach Upanishads also. So it's like a huge, vast topic. But for a few minutes or maybe an hour or one session, we can do just the Upanishads. That's, so there are three, no? History, Dharma, Upanishads. The fourth is India's relationship with the West. So that's also a very big topic we can do. And the fifth is Indian art. So all sorts of, whether it's visual arts, performing arts, um, drama art, dance. So that's more uh, about the deep cultural, how culture has flowered in the aesthetics. So you remember the five? You want to choose which? <laughs> no, I mean, there are lots of hands. Devasmita, you can say. No, I think that the, uh, the sequence that you have given is very good. So you can start with the history of India and then you do dharma. But spirituality, if you can develop more, mm -hmm. because uh, everybody now has yes. to be conscious and read consciously yes. and uh, go deeper into spirituality. And then the other two. That's my opinion. Now let others say. Yes. What do you say? I like the Dharma, Upanishad, and the West. But maybe we can have more than two. Yes, of course. That's what I say. Yes, okay. We can have more than three. Of course. It depends on the interest of everybody. Yeah. So, Asteti, you have some choice about the titles that she has given? The history of India. Okay. So, anybody else who would like to say? I'll only say that I'm glad that the Rupa who worked first this. I'm glad that Ropa has put forward these lines because I think these few lines give you the essence of what Indian civilization has stood for when learning. Mm -hmm. And that with whatever uh, variables that have happened due to history and due to interaction within the country and with uh, cultures outside the country. With those variations, it has gone through the sensibility of the sense of the infinite, mm -hmm. which remains as the primordial foundational element of Indian culture and a sense of super sensible. Since we are sitting in Bhartavas, you will allow me to share that the first national conference that was held here, it was uh, late 1990s, what called the sense of the infinite. And some of the most uh, eminent uh, poets thinkers, philosophers of the country, and during Gunzar, he came for the conference. He, he was interested. The sense of the infinite, the sense of a suprasensible, which gives meaning to the sensible, that is at the essence. But India is a civilization, a people, that have loved to experiment. So this idea of the supersensible, which gives meaning to the sensible, has been experimented in myriad ways, and one can be lost in the myriad ways. And the critics have taken up one form or another. And that's all right, that's part of uh, World interaction. She will try to. But these things are essential. And I'm glad you have begun with that. Yeah. I just thank you for that. Mm -hmm. One more person. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm really interested in knowing a bit more about arts, mm -hmm. uh, Indian arts, because that is one, uh, one place, or I can say one point, where both these dimensions move together the physical and super physical. As you say, and I'm really, really interested in exploring that more. Okay. Uh, yeah. okay. <coughs> cousin, I would like to hear um, Dharma mm. because uh, you probably have an inkling of what's going on in all of it. A lot of uh, confusion, conflicts, and I find a whole lot of people here have no understanding of 
clarity on dharma. There is a lot of use of words like human unity, collaboration, family, but it's, it's and it, it, yeah. and it covers all range of things. Yeah, I think it's it's a very vast topic, and the three sessions will be really like squeezing it. And I want to make it a discussion. It's not that I am an expert that I have come to teach you something. We are all learning something together. And uh, there is uh, regarding where should we put our energy. So there is in the Rig Veda, which is the earliest uh, writing of Indian spirituality, towards the end, there is uh, the 10th mandala. There is a certain shloka called Hiranya Garbha shloka. So Hiranya Garbha is the lord of the universe. Another name of him is Virat. The Virat Purusha is one who is ranging about. He is the vast. So he is in this creation. He is in the universe. In his sutra, means a meditation to him, there is a refrain. And the refrain says, Kasmai Devaya Havisha Vidhema. Which means to which God am I going to offer my oblation? An oblation means everything that you can offer, your skills, what's special about you, what's unique about you as the individual. So here's the, the Rishi asking, which God should I offer my genius to? All of us have some genius in us and we have to keep questioning that. Like which God am I putting this energy behind? Like we are all instruments, but whose instruments are we? Even the titans are gods, so they can also use us and the, the good of those we think are the good forces and the evil forces, they are all forces ranging around and they can use us and we have this offering that we can pour into some fire. So which fire are, are we going to light? Is it going to be a fire of destruction or a fire of construction or a fire of collaboration, of human unity? And each of us has that question to ask. So in that sutra, there's no answer. It's just the question, because that question really doesn't have an answer. Each of us has the answer. And sometimes we are seeking that answer all our lives. And I know Auroville is a place where a lot of seekers have come. And perhaps you have the answer within you as to which God you're offering your oblation. So all this culture is trying to say that be clear as to which God you are offering because you all have that oblation within you. You have a genius. So use it in the right way. So we will also look at what that genius is in this culture and how much of it we have. And it really doesn't matter which part of the world we were born. It's an offering to the world. It's not just like it's from India. We have to have it stamped made in India. There's nothing like that. It's something that India has offered to the world. And Whoever is there to listen to this offering, please take it. Whichever part of it works, please take it. So, given that what I heard from you is that we want to do dharma. <coughs> Sorry. Dharma is something we want to do. And east-west relationship is also something we want to do. And also spirituality. So, perhaps that will be our three sessions. And then we can think of more sessions if you want to do history and... Uh, quick view of where India is going, the real renaissance that should happen, which is part of Indian art. So we'll start with Dharma then. And since we have this text that we'll share, we are not going to read it, but Asadi pointed out the kernel of it is that the sense of the infinite is at the root. The foundational work of the foundations of Indian culture is that they knew there is an infinite. That the human is not the last word of creation. He is not a perfect uh, product of the creator. He is just a work in progress. And given that he is not something that cannot reach perfection. He is somebody who can reach perfection. So every life is an opportunity to walk a little closer to perfection. So that kind of idea was at the foundation of Indian culture. We'll directly dive into dharma. This thing we call Sanatan dharma. We don't call it a religion. We call it a dharma. And dharma, the word comes from dhri. Dhri means to hold, which means to uphold. 
not just hold anywhere, any position, it's to uphold. So something that's holding you up or upholding you, that is the Sanatan Dharma. And the core values of this Dharma, we'll look at them one by one. So there will be a lot of Sanskrit terms also and uh, people are used to and in fact if you know these terms we'll just go ahead. Swadharma and Swabhava we all know it's it's what we have is Swadharma is the uh, Swabhava and Swadharma are like the genius within and how we act it out in life. Swabhava is how you act out and Swadharma is what is given to you as your your unique gift of the divine so you find it and this is what you manifest in the world adhikara so the concept of adhikara is the right so do you have the right to question a rishi for example do you have the right to ask anyone any question do you have the right to ask what the infinite is when you don't know what your emotions are. So you have to realize which position you are, you have to situate yourself. And the knowledge to be able to situate yourself in this whole range of knowledge, a range of consciousness, is itself something that needs a lot of consciousness. If you are not self-aware, you won't even know that you don't have the adhikar to ask a question or the right to ask a question. So this concept of adhikar vad or the right was very much part of the Indian culture. Like not everyone has the right to ask every question or to butt in every kind of fight or battle. You have to know what your capacities are and only then do you get into um, the calling. The calling will determine how good you are at something. So adhikar vad is something that is very easy to trans or, or to to defy or not to be aware of you go anywhere and you ask any question so right now especially how it shows up is that each of us with a lot of um, social media tools we have the capacity to be able to post a message to anyone, someone tweets something, we can, with zero cost, we can create an account and start sending messages to the world and have followers reply to us. Or we ourselves can reply anonymously to a lot of things. But do we question, do I have the adhikar to do it? I have the capacity, but do I have the right? So that's something, if you question, you'll see a lot of people will say, no, I don't have the right uh, to fight this battle. This is not my battle. You have to choose your battle and fight only those battles. And some battles you may feel very passionate about, but you don't have the genius to do it. You don't have the capacities. So it's not for you to fight this. It's not for you to even put a word in this. Because with a lot of words, there's a lot of noise that gets created. Which is now one of the problems of modernity, with, especially with these kind of easy access tools to say what you like even to say it without um, restraint. The responsibility, isn't it? Ha, it Adhikar is also responsibility. That is to be responsible of what you are putting forth, which yes. is not create havoc or this defamation. Yes. Yes, the, 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 the basic the courtesy of how you are saying, what you are saying, and even holding back. Silence is a very strong uh, way of being. Don't say if you cannot say or you don't know what we are talking about. Don't say anything. Say only something that you can add to. If it's really a value add in this discussion, then only say it. Otherwise, it's fine for you not to be part of this. So a lot of, it's one of the modern problems, basically, I'm seeing and maybe it's part of your experience also that people are um, transcending their adhikar and doing things that they ought not to. And then the concept of Purusha and Prakriti, I'm sure you all know, right? It's, it's the soul within and your nature. And what's 
in a small microcosm that's within the individual is also playing out in the macrocosm. So in the macrocosm, there is the Atman, which is the Purusha, and there is, <coughs> there is Prakriti, which is nature and capital, this, this huge nature that's around us, including the plants, animals, humans, all sorts of life forms, but also the forces. They are also part of nature that are playing around. They have a big say in what's happening in the, uh, the physical world. So these are now shades of the soul. In English, you probably, probably just have one word, soul, but there are so many shades of it. When you think of um, it in terms of the in Indian culture, so there is this Atman that's the consciousness around. The Brahman is the transcendental consciousness. The Jivatman is the individual consciousness. And within the individual consciousness, there is the spark that's growing from life to life. It hasn't become the complete divine. It's becoming the divine, but it is still a spark of the divine. It's veiled. And so that spark is called the Chaitya Purusha. And then you have the Antaryamin, someone who lives within, the divine that lives within. So there are three different uh, aspects of consciousness that are within us, the Jivatman, the Chaitya Purusha and the Antaryamin. All three live within and they are called the innermost being. In Shiva language, he, we have an innermost being, then we have the inner being and then we have the outer being. So three different kinds of um, beings that exist in us and each of them have their own uh, different limbs or parts, parts to them which we will not get into and I think all of you also know about these. And the veil we talked about, the Chaitya Purusha is veiled. It, it is the divine, but it doesn't know that it is the divine and it doesn't act out as the divine. And it doesn't remember that at one point it was the divine. So all this forgetting, the veil is called Maya, which is also called illusion because it's not reality. In reality, this thing is the divine, but it has forgotten. So we call it the Maya. And... There are different ways of looking at why this creation has happened. It's one of the questions that has been left dangling because it's again something that you have to work out. Why it has happened, why you are here, it's, it's your project or your seeking and no one else can tell you that's why you've been here. So one of the ways of saying you're here is because it's a game. You are a player in this game and this game is called Leela. There is a world view of a, a way of looking at Indian spirituality and that perspective says it's all a play of the divine, you are a player, so enjoy. And another perspective, you can call the Leela perspective as a very bright and a childlike perspective. We are playing a game. It's also Krishna's perspective, those who follow Krishna say it's the Leela. And then there is a pessimistic perspective which is Karma. The world is created for karma, through karma we work out things and because of karma we are in the suffering. So instead of looking at this world as a game and a fun place, it's a place of punishment. You haven't done something good in your past lives, therefore you are working it out in this life. So you don't have to use this rough word called punishment, but you can still use this as a justification for all the things that are not working right. So our karma as a humanity, we have tortured plants, we have tortured nature, we have tortured each other for so long that now it's the time of reckoning. So we are going through a very difficult period because as humanity we haven't done anything great for a long time. We can say that's the karma of um, the time spirit has chosen, oh this is the time you pay back. So that's one worldview. It's not the only worldview. Karma is just the way that some, like Buddhism has taken this theory and gone forward and made a, that made it one of its focus items. Whereas Bhakti movement, which is a huge movement in India, the aspect of love and working out spirituality through love has taken Leela. They've used Leela as their main concept. 
So in the karma theory, they use reincarnation. It's very important because if you are not playing a game and you, you're working out your past bad deeds, and if you are not able to work out in the few years you've been given in one life, what do you do? Do you go to hell and suffer forever? Or if you have done something good, you go to heaven and live in happiness forever. So this worldview says, no, you have to return. So one life is not enough to work out your karma. So you keep returning back and forth, back and forth until you have washed it off. And then you have a choice. Even then you can return. But you have a choice. So you have become, a, in the language of Buddha, you have become a bodhisattva. Or in the language of Sanatan Dharma, you have reached moksha. So you are a mukta, person who is free. And then at that point, you can choose to return on earth. So you'll be a jivan mukta. So you have come back on earth, you are living a life, but you are actually free. Jivan mukta. And for the Buddhists, you are a bodhisattva. If you come back to earth to help the other creatures that are suffering, the other sentient beings that need your help, so you come back as a bodhisattva or you become a Buddha. So you go across and you are living in the paradise, Buddhist paradise forever. So the cyclical nature of things is also ingrained in, just like reincarnation is recycling the soul, recycles parts and bits from nature. Our body is burnt, cremated, buried and it's recycled. It becomes food for some other creatures and at some point when a baby is born, it's breathing uh, air that used to be some, others hum some other humans at some point or some other creatures. So constant recycling is happening in nature, which we know about uh, from when we study ecology, we know the carbon cycle, the oxygen cycle. These are just small cycles. But this one talks about grander cycles. Whole cycle of creation has four cycles, four yugas. And if you ask how long is the yuga, it's like four, 430 million years. Like something, you, it's beyond conception. One life is nothing compared to what a yuga is. And there are four of these yugas. And then you ask, then what? Oh, it repeats. So there is no end to time. So if there is no end to time, is there a beginning of time? Is there a singularity point is there a big bang that set it all off so now that's a huge question that people ask and there are a lot of upanishads that have tried to answer that question the, the vedas have tried to answer that question when did it begin and different rishis have given their perspectives which don't meet so some rishis say i think it began this way some rishis say it began that way and this is where another core concept of this dharma comes up is pluralism that each of you is actually required to do your own seeking don't accept what some rishi has said do your own seeking and if you find something new that no one else has said fine this is yours there is no academic paper that you're writing writing so the indian epistemology it's not that you're building on someone else that uh, you know the usual uh, way of not the usual the the current world view of writing papers, because it's a very Western concept of writing paper, papers, is you start from the last person, the last word he has given, you start from there, and it's quickly you just say, that he said this, and then you do your research. But what if he was wrong? Then your research is also wrong, it's based on something that's wrong. And what if, he, it's not about him being wrong or right, it's something that you don't resonate with. And you resonate with nobody. All these academics that have come before you, you do not resonate with them. But still you have done your own self-searching and you have come up with the truth. Are you going to present it? Are you allowed to present it? Is it valid truth? Or people will look at the end of the paper and say, oh, there are no references. It's very important in uh, Western Academy style to have references. And in, in some... Colleges, they say you should have required, it's a requirement to have 10 references. That means you have looked at 10 different uh, scholars in this field and only then you have come up with something new. And it's possible that you still look at these 10 different scholars, but at the end you say, no, none of them resonate with what I know. I'm going to present my own thing. And this is from my experience. There is no proof because I have experienced it. 
it's not a scientific process which is repeatable because it's your consciousness you have started at a point is there a chance that someone else will start at your point exactly perhaps not so you cannot say it's repeatable it's universal um it's is it falsifiable like these are the three main things that the scientific methodology uses if you say if you claim that something is truth is a kind of truth it has to be repeatable anyone in the world can do universal any time they can do it at any altitude any part of the world and it has to be falsifiable that means if any one person says no that is not true that i have one example where it uh, goes against your definition of truth then that truth that you have seen is false it's falsified is the question that is only in scientific field it's not in spiritual field no because yeah. as we say it is sanatan dharma so each one has his or her path to attain exactly. and exactly. find the truth isn't it yes. so what you are speaking right now is the just the scientific in the scientific field that they say that there are some methods and it has to be similar if you want to right but what happened is the scientific methodology start with started with science but it, the same method is used for culture studies is used for spirituality so even if it is spirituality you have to base it on what others have said and did they have proof of it so all these things about proof material proof you cannot materially prove very simple things like what is consciousness is there a god you cannot prove these things but the whole subject is about these so you start your starting point is uh, defies the methodology so there is a lot of debate going on as to is that academic at all or it's just imagination somebody's imagination okay he has experience it's all great have you seen divinity in a stone it's a piece of stone and some people say no it's it's inanimate it cannot have the anima anima means the soul it cannot have whereas in all the cultures that worship idols they have brought a soul into this piece of stone and not only cultures that worship idols it's like michelangelo and all when they got uh, the david out of a lump of marble they saw this this being inside and they got it out and there was a child who asked, how did you know he was stuck in there or this goddess was stuck in there how did he know so there was um, some some life or some consciousness in that stone which he had the genius to carve out and we have so many stones we worship which we believe in so at, at right away at the very start of your academic paper if you say i i had an experience with a stone and i saw divinity in that stone it will not pass and i'm bringing this topic up because a lot of the world is still mentally colonized <coughs> by this way of thinking and oh if it is an academic paper it has to go back to this uh, this methodology and it has to work only then it's it passes but you see it's people of people with lower knowledge who are trying to judge higher knowledge so you cannot it's like you are measuring um a bacteria with your naked eyes your naked eyes are not um, capable of measuring the bacteria you need something called microscope and that microscope when you talk of higher and lower knowledge is your own consciousness you fine tune it you make it subtler and then only it can uh, apprehend that higher knowledge or higher consciousness otherwise you have no adhikar to talk about that higher consciousness or to even say that that is not truth that is not academically acceptable you cannot uh, get a degree in my college because i can't follow your methodology and this is where the indigenous people are responding back to the western world view and saying that oh, we have been decolonized but our minds are still colonized why do our universities still follow this way of doing things we have our own ways of apprehending truth and what it says is that each of us have the power to to think of truth to seek it our own way and we should do that and that word for each of us seeking our own truth is called pluralism so in in, in the indian context it started off with being very plural uh, the vedas said the this line they said for pluralism was there is one truth but people approach it from various ways they look at it differently 
ekam sat vipraha bahudha vadanti and that is the very foundational uh, text of indian dharma so we became a plural society for which we india we as an in india accepted uh, people of different religions races it's it became uh, a place where uh, people persecuted in other countries came and lived and india had open arms so that culture of pluralism was part of the dharma shastras so dharma shastras to start with or books law books were actually spiritual books so the early dharma shastras were in the veda the upanishad they taught us what to do with each other what society should do to structure it harmoniously and then it came away from the the shrutis as they are called revealed texts and it became mental texts smritis memories but still they held on to the core values then at some point it started getting watered down to this people in the lower rung who are judging the higher rung and they come up with laws that don't make sense they are laws that bind and break the people who are following the higher law and then they created a lot of divisions in society they created religion there was no religion it was a spiritual culture even now when some people say what's your religion they ask hindus or so called indians who are born in this culture they flinch because it's not a religion it's a spiritual way and we don't want to use the word religion because religion has been used to kill each other religion has become one of the biggest weapons of mass destruction so we don't want to use that word and we want to go back to spirituality or rather go forward to spirituality and say okay we we had the sad phase in humanity where we divided us by religion but let's forget it the time spirit doesn't want it anymore which is why i think there's a lot more conflicts showing up it's just showing the limitation of this thing called religion it's a human construct let's get over it and then you'll see how we were before we were a plural society and we'll return to being a plural society so another concept is that the understanding that we are not just the individual living here we are a collective so family values for example clan values nation, national values these values were very important more important than the <coughs> than the individual so there was a hierarchy of dharmas that people followed so the dharma that defined the individual's code of conduct was swadharma but above that swadharma swadharma is you can imagine the core and above that there is a sphere and that is the kula dharma or the family or clan you belong to and that clan has a dharma so you follow that dharma so now if you have a conflict between the two dharmas traditionally they chose the higher or the the bigger uh, the super set was chosen now if you have a conflict between the clan dharma and the national dharma the rashtriya dharma so you choose the rashtriya dharma so we don't say oh we are just uh, gujaratis or bengalis and tamilians we say we are indians because that binds us that dharma of being indian binds us more than the smaller dharma and then beyond the dharma of the nation was the dharma of humanity manushya dharma and then the planetary dharma then the universal dharma and the dharma of god these are like bigger and bigger spheres so now depending on what you should do when when you are faced with a dilemma then you look at which dharma you are going to follow and this was the dilemma of arjuna in the gita which dharma should i follow if i follow my my own dharma i, I don't feel like killing my grandfathers but if i follow the dharma of my clan i need to kill them because they have done some they are aligned with the evil forces so he was in big conflict so krishna walks him through these different dharmas the gita is a text it's a dharma shastra and it's a spiritual text that walks him through and at the end what krishna says is give up all dharmas every dharma is finally a binding this is sarva dharman parityajya mam ekam sharanam vraja so the highest dharma is to surrender to the divine and i will take care of all your dilemma aham tva sarva pape bhi mokshishyami mashuch don't worry i'll take care of everything 
and only then arjuna could surrender to krishna and he says at that point he says okay i am yours you tell me what to do and krishna says fight that's your highest dharma and not only fight they even used ruse to fight fight they lied they went against the dharma of the kshatriya so the warrior has a dharma you are not supposed to kill someone who's on the ground who you you have to fight chariot to chariot ground to ground weapon to weapon he is unarmed he is standing on the ground and arjuna kills him which goes against the dharma of the kshatriya but he could do it because krishna said there are these various layers of dharma and you have acted from the higher dharma so that cancels the logic of the lower dharma so it's it's something that really confuses people who are uh, say what's your book uh, what's your dharma book this is our dharma book which tells you forget all dharmas okay we are really confused and then they say oh by the way this is not the only book there are so many other books so it can get confusing because it's like a radical pluralist society it's like it's so open open ended no beginning no end because that's what you are your soul doesn't have a beginning you haven't been born you you are always being born and you're <laughs> going to be always be born and if that is your truth this your soul's truth then it's the truth of all us all of us society so society also is going to keep getting born again and again and you can't fix it down with this is the dharma and only this will work it will work for you but it may not work for someone else and you cannot impose it on someone else so luckily when india got independence we are not going to follow any of these old dharmas they decided so we still need a law book that the judiciary needs a law book to fight the cases right and the judiciary is that body which fights the case for dharmas so it needs a book so we wrote a book for that and it took us about 3 years to write that book and that's called the constitution of india and they went back to these dharma shastras and they picked what's uh, what's the core value they really question what is the core value of this nation of this dharma and they put it in this book it's a 5 400 page document because it's written in legalese it's legal document but finally if you see the core values they have been put in one page the first page the preamble all these values of pluralism that no matter what gender race caste class religion no matter what you belong to you will be treated equally and equality is an extremely important concept of this dharma and with it you cannot have equality without fraternity and liberty so all these things were put together and some people say okay these three words were taken from the french revolution but they were also taken from the core concepts or core books from indian culture and luckily all these accretions that came in between the they have been cycles of our culture where there was a decline so during the decline a lot of stratification came in which we also know as the caste system the untouchability as a practice so all these were removed when we did the constitution there will not be anything called untouchability we gave freedom to all the religions you go and preach if you want to preach you preach you want to convert people do that we are not going to interfere so we give you freedom to do what you like and we also say that you you cannot force anyone to convert let them come come to you of their own choice if they are convinced with your arguments well and good but no physical force no psychological force because each of us is equal and free so what is authority and there is uh, inherently in this culture a lot of um, reverence is given to authority so authority to start with is the books vedas the shrutis are authority so we say that if something is written in these books they have been revealed to us by our rishis so they are um, the starting point if they say there is god then we accept there is god and we have a lot of reverence for authority so much so that children are taught that they have to touch the feet of elders it's part of you know cultural training and some children could ask why am i touching these people's feet 
some children also say, I'm, I'm going to teach, touch only God's foot. And the answer to them is, no, practice it. It doesn't matter if that elder person is uh, smarter than you or not so smart or something. Just practice it because it, it's practice for humility. At some point, perhaps you your soul is much riper than this person you are touching. But why don't you practice humility? At some point, you'll be humble enough to realize that your soul is not so ripe. There is a long way to go. So, uh, three more concepts. The concept of arhat is deserving. The word arhat means you are deserving. It is related to adhikar. That only when you are deserving, you are given what you, are, what you need. So, in the old days, uh, when a student went to the teacher, to the rishi, the rishi could find out if that person was deserving of this kind of knowledge. It's, uh, nowadays, we go to school because we are young and it's, it's been made compulsory. That each, each one has to go to school because it's good for children. And you go to school depending on how much your parents can afford. So, all those things didn't matter. It's how good you are, what kind of soul you have brought in. Or where you are in your journey of lifetimes. Only that kind of teacher will be able to help you. So Krishna, for example, they say that he too had to go to school. He is the Lord. People didn't know. And he, he goes to school and the teacher just gives him one word. And he becomes realized. And the teacher says, okay, I cannot teach you anything. Because you know more than me. So your schooling is over. <laughs> so so that's, that's what uh, arhat means. If you are... Um, Deserving, then only you get what you are deserving. And this word is used in Buddhism to mean those who have realized. Or the Buddhas, or those who are enlightened are called Arhats. And two other concepts, Bhakti is love, love for the divine. And it's one of the paths of yoga. Like there is karma. So those who have propensity to work who prefer to reach the divine through work, to be the instrument of the divine as a working or a material instrument, they follow the path of karma yoga. Those who have a great heart, who can connect to the divine better through the heart, they follow bhakti yoga. Others who have a very, uh, where knowledge is something that they like to play with, abstractions, debates, so they follow jnana yoga. That's not the only three. We have raja yoga, we have uh, so many other different kinds of yoga that exist. Which and some of these yogas existed, don't exist anymore, like Sankhya Yoga, not there anymore. But it was. At some point, people used that to progress. Now we use Patanjali's yoga, which is one of the big mainstream yogas. But at some point, there was no Patanjali yoga. He himself collected around 200 BC. He collected all these different yogas that existed. He put it together and he said, okay, I will call it uh, Ashtanga Yoga. Because there are eight limbs in this yoga. People who want to follow it, do follow it. Avatar, you know, it's um, the descent of the divine. Then a sacred mundane relationship is uh, that there was no real pure mundane custom. Custom means something that binds people together in a family or in a community. Where you do something together to achieve something. For example, a marriage. Marriage is two people are getting united. They're starting a new family. But it's a collective custom, a celebration, where the whole community comes together to bless this couple. And the chants that are performed are sacred chants. One could ask, it's two people who are getting married. Why, why do we have sacred chants in it? But it's been found that India has a lot of customs and all these customs are mixed with sacred chants. So there was nothing called a mundane custom, just a non-divine custom, what in modern language we would call a secular custom. So this this word secularism is contest, contested. Yes. yes. I just have a question that yes. uh, uh, this uh, chanting of mantras during marriage, for yes. example, they are done also to protect the couple and the families mm -hmm. and also to create a auspicious uh, atmosphere around. Yes. Yes. So it has a deeper meaning. 
Yes, absolutely. It's it's like marriage in heaven. Because um, it's it's not just two people who are meeting, it's two souls who are meeting and they'll do their journey for several years together in this incarnation. So that's an important, important concept to be walking, walking together. So that's why you bring the blessings of the forces that are around. You bring the goodwill of people. You bring the goodwill of the transcendental God. So Brahma as creator is invited to be a witness in the marriage. And that's just one of the customs. A simple custom of lighting lamps may have been at one point to kill the insects that are monsoonal insects. They come around that period, end of October, beginning of November. They, they are those... Um, Huh. They fly, they are ants that fly who get wings. So they need those lamps to come and dive into. They, they self-immolate. So instead of just saying let's light lamps for the insects, it has become a big tradition of inviting Rama back from the forest exile. So when Rama comes home, everyone is happy, they light lamps. Or you say it's one of the customs in which Kali, Kali has come to earth. Kali is a goddess of midnight, so in midnight you light the lamp. So there are different ways uh, we mix the mundane and the sacred. And animism is, they call it, um, in some cultures they think it's a very ancient or pagan religions had animism where you believe that the soul exists in nature, in stone, in this wooden chair that has been carved by human hands or in plastic that's really uh, taken from fish bones, transformed so many times through factory processes. Does it have a soul? Is it without any consciousness? So the belief that everything has a soul is called animism. And this is not just in past religions, it's there in current Dharma traditions. They believe that everything has a soul. So pluralism, we talked about it. And part of pluralism is to realize that we are a diverse nation and we have invited more diversity. And we are trying to create a unity through diversity. So it's never a uniformity. And if part of it is to also debate and to figure out what will work for us harmoniously, we do that. But we don't have to kill each other for letting diversity exist. We can, there are millions of ways to uphold diversity and not um, deconstruct each other's ways of being. So these two go hand in hand, pluralism and diversity. And now related to these uh, core values, there are customs or practices. So these things are talked about again in uh, the Gita especially since it's the Dharma text. It tells us how to live. It tells Akshatriya how to live, how to live life. So these are all from the, if you have read the 16th chapter of Gita, first three shlokas, all you have to read is first three shlokas. And it is a string of these values that you practice in life to uphold the core values we saw in the previous slide. So how do you uphold them? You practice Arjavam. So Arjavam is the root word for Arya. I have a question about Arjavam. That word exists in the Gita? Yes, it is. It is. In the Gita, in the Gita 16 chapter. It, it may have come from Upanishad, but it's there in the Gita also. And as we know, this, there's really no dating of which text came first and it's it's for people who are really interested in dating. Uh, I'm not. And that's fine too. Like, so Arjavam is the root word for Arya, which is the name of the race. And Iran also has the, its name taken from Arya because they also share a lot of values with Dharma traditions. So they also say that those people are the Aryan people and India also thinks that we are the Aryan people. And we will absolutely not get into the discussion of where they came from, if they came from, if they fought, and not interesting. What is interesting is to practice Arjavam. And Arjavam means straightforwardness, nobility. So practicing, and it, there is a word Ari in Arjavam as etymological. Ari means enemy. 
So how is the word enemy in practicing straightforwardness? It's like you are conquering your inner enemies. All the vices you have are your enemies and you are conquering them. Only then you can follow the path of straightforwardness. This core value, core practice, Arjavam, Samatha. Second is Samatha and that is equality. And the whole of second chapter of the Gita is dedicated to practice of Samatha. When Sri did his, he himself devised a new kind of yoga. And he has written it in his diary which got published in the last 15 years. It's called the Record of Yoga. His, it starts with Samatha, practice of Samatha. So there's something called passive Samatha, something called active Samatha. So in <laughs> passive Samatha, you have gradations. So you start with Titiksha, Udasinata, Nati. Then you go on to active Samatha. So it's very detailed ways of practicing Samatha. What it means is equality. So you practice equality within yourself, whether you get all the, all the things that you get from the outside, whether it's joy or sorrow, all the dualities, you're practicing equality. And when you practice equality outside of yourself, there you treat everyone, every creature equally. equally. So the practice of Samatha is like an individual practice and a collective practice. Absolute core value. And yoga means union. And as we talked about, there are various ways to reach the divine, to unite with the divine. It's, it's a sorry state of affairs that when, you, when we say yoga, most people think of it as asana. <laughs> At some point, maybe we'll recover that word and it will be called asana. Hatha yoga will be called asana and yoga will be a much more revered word as it was supposed to be. Ahimsa is also a core value. It has been extremely contested. So Ahimsa is non-aggression or non-hatred, non-cruelty. Now, what do you mean by non-cruelty when Krishna teaches Arjuna to fight? So it's what is non-cruelty or non-hatred is a very big concept. And Arjuna, even when he fought, he practiced Ahimsa. Go figure. So it's, it's one of those wonderful things that we can seek and find out why it is so. And it's like talks and talks can be given on Ahimsa. And you can compare with what happened with Indians, to Indians, against Indians. What did Indians do? Did they never fight? They fought. So, so many things have happened in history. So if you look from the perspective of Ahimsa, and see how it has been interpreted by the Jains. It's a different kind of Ahimsa. By the Buddhists, different kind of Ahimsa. By the so-called Hindus, it's a different. But they all had Ahimsa as a core value and they agreed on this thing that it's non-hatred, non-aggression, non-violation of other people's rights. Then purity is um, also shaucha. It's one of the things that are practiced. Purity of thoughts, uh, purity of deeds, purity of uh, speech. So shuddhi, the word shuddhi you will find in lots of places. Vak shuddhi means purity of speech. And shuddhi of thoughts, manas purity. This, that, you'll see that it's, it's all over the dharma practice that you have to practice purity. And those who think purity is only in the kitchen, like you cannot eat meat and you're good, you're pure, they're not even scratching the surface of purity. It's a very difficult practice. To not even have a wrong thought, forget even articulating it, not even allowing that wrong thought to come. Purity is that deep a practice. Tolerance, part of ahimsa, part of pluralism, freedom, we talked about that. If you, if you give... Pluralism, you believe in pluralism, you have to give freedom to people. Seva is also a concept um, that is helping others. Since we discussed, no, we are a collective society and we give a lot of importance to the wishes of the collective. We go out of our way to help. Modesty. Again, humility like we talked about. It's one of the core values that... No matter how great you are, you're still uh, not so great. 
there's a long way to go to greatness. Only the divine is as great as you can be. So they say the more you know, the lesser you uh, feel that you know. And there are shlokas that say that you, it's in the Isha Upanishad, those who are following after knowledge are entering a dark space. Those who are following only after knowledge are entering a darker space. Because that exclusivity itself is very problematic. So they are more ignorant than those who are following just after knowledge. Then moderation is, is something that Buddha really took forward as his main principle. It's the eightfold path with moderation or the middle path, which is most important, not excess in any direction. Then there are three gunas of nature, sattva, rajas, tamas, that we all have in different quantities and we are acting them out. These are the three uh, things or beings we have within us. We have the animal, the pashu, we have the hero and we have the god in us. Pashu, veera and deva. So they are all there and roughly they translate to the tamo guna the Raja Guna and the Sattva Guna. And we are all a mixture of these different quantities. Every day perhaps we are changing some quantities of these. Now aim of uh, this Dharma is self-realization. Not self-aggrandization or self-anything but realizing the true self. Now the four Purusharthas are the four aims in life. So there's Artha, Kama, Dharma, Moksha. Roughly what they mean is that you, you, you can have four aims in life and you should have these four aims. And these are you should go after material, you should thrive, you should go after prosperity, not neglect material life. So that's Artha. Kama is not neglect your emotional life. All the desires, the very beautiful desires that exist, the higher vital, cultivate those. And then dharma is cultivate dharma, cultivate righteousness of character. And also cultivate the aim to go beyond, to transcend all this. To bring back the divine within all this. So be the jivan mukta. Don't escape out of this. Go there, get this plenitude and come back here and manifest it. In your little way, in your grand way, whatever you can, just do this. And for that, there are these four different ashramas or different stages of life that you pass through. So the first as a student, Brahmacharya, you cultivate one kind of, uh, you cultivate knowledge, you cultivate dharma. And then you practice it in your grihastha life. When you're married, you're working, you're exchanging wealth with people so you at that point you are cultivating artha and kama and then after that you start releasing these you let the children the younger ones take over your this work that you were doing to earn to exchange wealth with others so you get into the fourth ashrama is vanaprastha so you get into the forest so which means you're leaving behind attachment and the last ashrama is sannyasa where you have completely severed all attachment to life and you're just thinking of the divine. So these four ashramas perhaps existed at some point, but they are put forth as goals so that you can focus. When you're a student, just focus on dharma. You don't have to worry about money. You don't have to compare how much you have with your classmate. Just, just do this bit. Earn, earn knowledge because that's the right place to earn knowledge. And then earn wealth in the next stage of life. And then earn punya and then earn the divine. I have a question. Uh, for ashram, that's why they're called ashrama. Why the word comes uh, the ashrama. ashrama. You know, it will be good yeah. to explain a little bit. Uh, yeah. The aims are very beautiful, but the word, why they're uh, codified as ashrams. ashrama. So ashrama comes from ashray. Ashray means refuge. So it's only later it has become only a spiritual place of refuge. But before even in life, like we said, mundane, sacred, it was all hyphenated. It was a conjunction, not two separate concepts. 
so even in life when you are going through a household life earning money a workplace these are all these have sacredness in them so they are also ashramas they are your ashray they are your refuge so for that period of life the school is your refuge next the household is your refuge your workplace is your refuge then it becomes the forest is your refuge and last is the cave is your refuge or the mountains are your refuge so these are the that's why the word ashram yes root for sharanam no ashra no the word a is very important to start with sharanam is uh, different it is uh, it is possible you know i shouldn't say no it's possible yes maybe sharanam and ashra are linked yeah surrender surrender dedication yeah it is possible you know yeah if you look at the etymology because a when you add the word the the prefix a it is like from all around so so maybe sharanam and asharanam it's possible that that's the etymology then parampara means lineage so there has been a lineage of gurus and shishyas that means the teacher and the student the teacher has passed on all his teachings to a student or a group of students and then they've gone on so this parampara at in the beginning it was all oral tradition so the question why didn't they write it down it's related to adhikarvad now think of it if the books were all written down all that knowledge was written down someone who is not ready could have picked up the manuscript read it and misused it it's like the knowledge of splitting the atom uh, you can do so many things with an atom <coughs> that has been split including making a bomb so you're giving the blueprint to someone who's not ready to look at the divine within the atom shiva rides in his chariot in the atom instead of looking for shiva in that atom you use it to create a bomb so similarly if you give knowledge of these transcendental matters people who are not ready pick it up and they aggrandize their ego so this ego inflation that happens and it's very harmful to them what they do to the others is secondary but for that soul to think that i am the divine because yes we really are but can you directly jump to that conclusion and go tell everyone i am the divine at the same time you have to say you too are the divine if you cannot say that at the same time that means you, the ego got inflated and because you picked up this text and you read it at the wrong time you didn't have the adhikar so to be sure that it didn't go to the wrong hands they used the oral tradition in fact there are some initiation processes where they whisper they whispered the mantra in the ear of the initiate and that initiate is not allowed to tell anyone what his guru taught him she or he cannot say what the guru taught because it's just to that person it's a secret it's a secret weapon secret knowledge that will help that soul progress it may not help the other souls progress and it is not open to discussion it is not something you can tweet and everyone put their comments and your mind will spin around will there be negative comments it's it's not open to any of this kind of treatment so this parampara took care of that that secret which is still being practiced like i said the initiates get a mantra it's it's very much part of this tradition it's part of other traditions also like the native american tradition the they have for example shamanism ayahuasca is a way to release a lot of consciousness to release a lot of potencies that are within but they won't just put it in a book there is no manual that tells you how to guide someone to have ayahuasca even westerners when they come to this specialists and they say please teach us how to do we'll go back to the west and we'll become ayahuasca masters they say no you don't have the adhikar you haven't done the life you haven't walked in our shoes for those years and years that we have walked in the shoes not just us our souls have prepared to be a shaman in this life you haven't done that so we can't just give you this knowledge and you're going to definitely misuse it 
and there'll be people who will die of your misuse. Ayahuasca is a very potent way of releasing consciousness, you know. So we cannot do that. So even asking a question to a Native American a master is not allowed. So if, if they ask if one or two Westerners are allowed to sit in their circle, they are told specifically, please don't ask questions. Because you don't have the adhikar. If you are lucky enough to be part of this in the audience, you are not even supposed to see it. Oh, and of course you are not supposed to take videos or record because it's for one time. It's for feeling in that moment. It's an experience that people are going through. It's not for later use. So that's very much part of the parampara. And it's practiced in India. We talked about bhakti. Uh, Deepa, I just wanted to ask yeah. you a question about uh, in parampara, what about this when uh, you go to a temple, they ask you what is your gotra? What is that? Can you just uh, say, say a little yes. bit because it goes in the line of yes, parampara. parampara. Yeah. So the concept of gotra is that all Indians were born of a few um, original rishis. So <laughs> you can trace your lineage to one of these rishis who are called the Prajapatis. Praja is subject and they are the lord of the subjects. So rishis actually had children and those children had multiple children. And so the lineage grew and it became wide like a, like a sea. And all the seas joined into an ocean. So all these people, you can finally trace back your origin to one rishi. So that is what is called Gotra. Yeah. Japa, Arati, Sadhya, these are all ways of worshipping. So since we are doing practices, it's the repeat, repetition of a sacred word or a sacred name is Japa. Arati, is there is a way to invoke the divine. It's all different ways to bring in all the forces on your side, all these occult forces that are roaming around. You bring them on your side and you, you ask them to help you progress. Now, if you don't want these forces, you don't need them or you're not open to them, you don't have to perform aratis. So again, no one forces anyone to go to temples. Sandhya is the twilight time, right? Like right now, it's a very special time because the day and the night are sort of shaking hands and the forces of night wake up and the forces of day sleep. So it's a time when all the forces are awake. They're transitioning. It's like the change of guards. And at that moment, if you can pray and listen to both of them or ask them to help you, then it's most propitious. So there are these three moments when there's change of guards, a change of time. It's the morning twilight, dawn, dusk and noon, where the sun is crossing over uh, on the other side from east to west. It's overhead and it's crossing over. So that time, there are these three times that people do these pujas or they, they stop whatever they're doing and they start uh, invoking the divine. It's like aligning all your energies to this zone of occult forces. The Muslims do five times, so the, the Hindus or Orthodox Hindus, they do three times. Those um, who are always connected to the divine do it always. So you don't really have to have this practice, sit and do at some point or the other. Can you name, uh, like Sandhya is the twilight. I love yeah. this, the name Godhuli, when the Godhuli. cows are going home mm -hmm. and putting for the dust. Similarly, in the morning, how do you call the the, that period and mm. at noon. So, uh, okay. mm. Usha. Usha is morning and she's, she's a goddess. There are lots of uh, hymns to Usha in the, in the Vedas, in the Rig Veda, which is the ancient, most ancient text. And there is also a verb that comes out of Usha. Ushavat means one who is dawn-like. Those who are... Uh, who are able to take in uh, the dawn, the new kind of dawn, who are future looking, so they are Ushavat. And then dus dusk is people who are able to work with silence. So that's the time when we are getting into sleep. So those who are able to transform Tamoguna, that quietude, and uh, yeah, quietude into poise, into peace. So that's the second time. And the middle, middle, uh, the noon, I don't know if there is a special meaning. 
Okay. And but the, how, how do you explain means in modern world, mm-hmm. Sandhya means in Indian philosophy there is a very deeper meaning mm-hmm. into it that uh, the change of forces, yeah. you know. But uh, now at night it is no more quiet. People are just <laughs> making so yeah. much of noise, you know. Means that yeah. the, one has forgotten about that beauty and the silence to appreciate yes, the silence. Yes, yes, that is true. It a bit a bit of the forces are not part of the physical world. So if you are listening in the inner ear, perhaps it's quiet. But it's difficult to train the inner ear. So we are listening in the outer ear and we get distracted by the noise. So you have to really find a place that's high up in the mountains or really far from. Even darkness, to find pure darkness, Ratri, there is a beautiful sukta called Ratri Sukta, where you are invoking the goddess, goddess night. She has so much power, so much beauty. Complete darkness, we hardly find that, you know, that beauty of darkness. We are mostly scared of darkness, but she is a goddess. I have a question. Um, maybe it will help me um, clarify my preconception about certain things. Uh, somewhere from my perspective, I find there is a contradiction between the practices that has been happening. Like for example, parampara, uh, as you explained, uh, where uh, the knowledge has been passed down or initially maybe whispered. Mm-hmm. And there was a ceremony called Ratabandha mm-hmm. uh, in which it happens where, uh, you know, the the mentor, Vratamanda is an initiation ceremony where you, you go to Brahma, uh, sorry, the first uh, ashram, mm. Brahmacharya ashram, mm. you start that and you start to gain knowledge and the, uh, the Guru whispers uh, a mantra. mantra. Mm. Somewhere I feel it goes in contradictory with Samatha and uh, poor value, two reason because we always see it happening to a male bound part of it and I'm curious to know. <laughs> That how yeah. uh, this practice has been, uh, have it existed not in contradiction with some of the at any point of Yeah, so apparently there was no gender bias in India. At the early days, there were lots of Rishinis or Rishikas who wrote in the Vedas who contributed to the Vedas, they were part of the Gurukul system, they studied, they taught, they were gurus also, who were female gurus, but at some point, uh, it started becoming male-dominated, a patriarchal society, and we don't know, a lot of people try to find, of course, there are finger pointings that go on, it's them who brought it to India, India didn't, you know, those stories, so we don't know, that's the thing, we don't know, but if you study from the perspective of human psychology, it's uh, the male psychology is different from the female psychology, and they, they, the males are um, stronger in body. So as long as humanity is at the level of the body, there will be a domination, male domination over women. And if it comes to the level of the vital layer or the emotional level, you'll see that women have more resilience. So it could be that women are going to dominate men once we start rising. And there have been societies which are matriarchal or matrilineal societies like Kerala, Manipur. There are some societies where the women work. Tamil Nadu also has a... And in animal kingdom, there are a lot of places where women are the dominant creatures like tigers, tigresses are the ones who choose what to eat, who is eating what because they are the ones who hunt. Males are not hunting and males are just dancing around. Uh, They are doing the dance for the females. Females get to choose. So things, if you look at psychology, lots of things have happened. And then who writes the books? Dharma Shastras. Males have written. So they have added all these things. Here I was going to come. I think uh, everything became very narrowed down from Manu. Manu Sutra. From there, I think all the differences of women and men came and all the women were a little pushed out to the corner as if they are not uh, actually for any knowledge, you know, the spiritual knowledge. Yes. So there are several Dharma Shastras. One is by Yajya Valkya. He is a Rishi of uh, the Brihadaranika Upanishad. And he has absolutely egalitarian worldview. 
he is the one who told talk to his wife maitre and allowed her to come with him or sort of took her she, who is he to allow right wrong word is <laughs> so he asked he gave uh, his wealth to his two wives katyayani and maitre and katyayani was in the level of the matter so she was very happy to get his wealth and she said okay goodbye he is going off but maitre said ye na hum namrita syam kim hum te na kuryam like if she, will i become immortal with all this wealth he says no so then what what am i going to do with wealth rather take me with you where you are going because you are going after immortality so this is come come with me and then there is a whole conversation with maitre and yajyavalkya that go on about love uh, and where he is giving equal footage to women and men and there is no such concept of equality itself because the very when you start as asking the question was there gender equality you are asking it from the lens that at some point there was no gender equality but at that point they don't even question gender equality it's like all of us are souls so yajyavalkya wrote his dharma shastra is called yajyavalkya dharma shastra but how many of us know it or read it we just remember manu manu smriti as the dharma shastra it's because this is the text that has been mutilated over ages there have been people who have added shlokas where manu says one of the places he says the place where women are worshipped is the place where gods live therefore worship women in your society yes yatra naryastu pujyante tatra ramante devata he has said this so the person who says this couldn't have said that women have to treat their husbands like gods and listen to them and even if the these so called gods beat them they have to take it as gift from god the same person couldn't have said this even that some other Uh, he's disciples that somebody must have changed not even text yes people th- there are so many versions of manusmriti that there are scholars who study only manusmriti and the various versions and they have pointed out okay this is one voice because manusmriti manu has a certain way of writing shlokas he has a certain erudition and he has a world view which is pluralistic equality equality is very part of it so these are from manu they got a version okay this looks like pure manu and then through the ages all these additions have been made and a lot of them have been made by brahmins they have invented the caste system and they said oh we are the greatest and everyone has to listen to us oh but we don't have money so they colluded with the kshatriyas the rich people and said okay we too are the greatest so we are the higher caste and then the rest are not and then to be sure that the rest never get a chance we put in the text rules that women and and lower caste are not allowed to study these texts so we are going to make sure they will not even question it because if they study they'll find the true voice of manu and they say if manu said this he couldn't have at the same time said this they will figure out so they made sure but of course this game couldn't go on forever so women caught on the lower caste caught on and they're still catching on that's the sad part this still equality not has not been reached in india I think Lopa yeah. uh, it is so interesting we can go on go on it because she has really touched the very vast uh, knowledge of uh, in, about India and very beautifully I must say so we will continue on this if you have some more things to touch yeah. right now you mm-hmm. can but we will try to finish it in the 5 minutes and we'll continue with uh, all these questions everybody i hope has noted and we will send also the youtube about this uh, recording of uh, lopa so that uh, you can study little bit and come with lots of questions yeah so just the last few things as you can see on screen i've showed you this there's one uh, this is the end of the practices after that we don't talk more about practices so there is this about what you touched upon gotra it's kula jati rashtriya manushya so these are the different kinds of dharmas that exist including yuga yuga dharma that's the time spirit so you have a choice between all these dharmas what you should stick to but have a dharma there are a lot of people who are still floating around so for them they say okay no have a dharma it helps and have a ishta devata also it's like one god 
because because we are still very narrow human beings it helps us to start with some ladder some scaffolding so that scaffolding could be one god that you connect with the most but once you have finished connecting with that god don't stick to it don't fight for that god the shaivas vaishnavas fighting for each other it's it's just childishness it's just these are just ways to help you progress and once you are done with it let the scaffolding go just rise above and shastra and yoga shastra is the text the spiritual text and yogas are the practice so one is the um, doxa and the other is the praxis or the theory and the practice there are several shastras there are several yo- yoga or texts of yoga including shri aurobindo synthesis of yoga is one of the yoga books and then yajna means sacrifice and adhikara is a practice um so sacrifice is also a very important concept which we started this whole discussion with in the hiranya garbha sutra to which god am i going to sacrifice kasmai devaya havisha videma which god you have something special in you which fire are you going to light it's very important for us to decide to light the right fire and adhikar is like we decided we talked about the right to ask a question the right to even pick up a book and read it you decide it's a practice so we have to practice adhikarvad with ourselves it's difficult to go tell someone else you have no right to ask this question that person has has to decide whether he or she is capable of asking a question we don't have the right to, we don't have the adhikar to say you don't have the adhikar right to say you don't have adhikar but we have to practice it dil- diligently within ourselves we have to curtail it and we have to say you know what this is not a discussion i'm going to get into i know what's happening i'm sort of aware of it but it's not my battle i have to choose my battles so there are lots of little battles that people get involved in and they get sort of lost in that way so to them it's just important to say hey think of adhikar do you have the adhikar for that do you want to spend time you just have uh, a few years with this kind of genius with you are you going to use their genius for this kind of thing but if activism is your calling go for it do it yeah. so i'll end here and i'll uh, share whatever you want to see if you want these but these two things that these two slides that we shared that we talked about today and next time we'll continue from here we'll look at east west relationship also we'll see where that went and where it is right now there's a huge thing called post colonial scholarship in india what are they doing what are they thinking of are they progressives or regressives where they are without being judgmental we're just looking at them from a very pluralistic lens so we not challenging anyone this is the platform where we are trying to really open up to uh, the core values of what dharma teaches us okay we'll end here yeah. okay thank you